Good morning, everybody in California. Good afternoon, everybody on the East Coast, and good evening to, I think, the rest of the world. Um, I'm Kevin Jones, curator of the Fitta Museum, and we are Instagram Live again on our Friday uh, collection conversation. And today I am going to be talking with Caroline Bellios, and I see that she is coming in, so let me get her live with me. We're going to be talking today about this stuff right here. <laughs> oh, Carolyn. Hello, how are you? Fine, how are you? I'm well, thank you. Um, you're just sitting right over here from me, right? You're not really kind of across the country, are you? Of course, it's just we decided we wanted different backgrounds. That's right, that's right. Well, welcome to the Fitta Museum Collection Conversation. I'm so glad you could be with me today to talk about something that is a great passion of yours, which is all things yes. hair. <laughs> hair work. That's right. Yeah. We are fortunate uh, to have a really, really wonderful collection of hair work, jewelry, uh, and some other things that we're going to talk about today in the Fitta Museum collection. And I just want to say at the very beginning, um, we, we have lots of images to show. So we kind of, I've got to get, get this going. But all of the jewelry that you are going to see today uh, was generously donated to the Fitta Museum uh, now about 11 years ago by Andrea Tice in memory of her mother, Carmelita Johnson, who, like you, Carolyn, um, had a really great passion for hair work jewelry. And she collected for more than 30 years and uh, put together a really astounding collection. I mean, just kind of almost like every single type uh, of hair work that, that is, was made uh, in, in the 19, actually late 18th century, 19th century, and the early 20th century. Uh, so I'm excited to get to kind of go over some of those today. Now, I do want to do a little intro about Caroline. Uh, Caroline Bellios is the professor of fashion design and history at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. So she is coming to us today from Chicago. Uh, and you are currently an MA student in the Department of Visual and Critical Studies. Uh, uh, your current research ranges from the 19th century hair jewelry, embodiment, and the transformative nature of touch, which is extraordinary. And especially, I mean, so relevant today where none of us can really seem to touch each other. It's gonna be really nice someday to give you a hug physically. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and also the potential of fashion in the museum space, memory, uh, memory space, and the platforms for inclusivity, which is fantastic. Um, with colleagues in the city, uh, Chicago, Carolyn is building the Chicago Fashion Lyceum, a new collaborative body for fashion discourse, which is very exciting. And I'm glad we are going to have a discourse today. So we put out... Um, an announcement that you're going to be visiting with us today. And some of our viewers came back with questions. So I thought before we dive into the actual images that we maybe set a groundwork for what hair work jewelry is, how it was developed and so forth. Um, so I have a number of questions that I want to ask you first, and then we're going to look at the very beautiful objects. How is that? Sounds great. Good. All right. So can you please talk about the uh, cultural context of Hair work. Well, hair work, hair has been important in many different societies, communities around the world um, as a source of adornment for, well, since, as far as we can tell, since the beginning of any kind of history or artwork that we have. If we look at the, the tiny statue of the Venus of Willendorf, it is hypothesized that perhaps the what's happening on the top of her head are the, the curls of her hair, or it could be braided hair that is up mm -hmm. there actually. Um, so throughout history and different cultures, hair has had different types of significance for the people of that community. I'm specifically looking at hair work that was happening in the United States and in England and in Europe in the 19th century, which was based on a tradition of many hundreds of years in Europe of using hair as a way to remember people who were deceased. So it was very important in a lot of European societies to think about death as a reminder to be a good person while you were alive. So this idea of a mental mori, um, it's a humbling experience to think about death while you're alive. And so you often see in art, you'll often see skulls that are incorporated in there and other mm -hmm. reminders of death. And so hair was also incorporated into some of these objects of jewelry that people would wear 
both to think about the living and the dead, and then also to have a way to stay in contact, to stay in physical communication with someone that they had loved who had departed. So this idea of touch, um, this idea of hair existing in, in the same form after we die, the rest of our, our external body parts will eventually decay. But hair has a chemical composition apparently that it could last for um, thousands of years. We've, we've uncovered burial sites where hair is still present on the body and still flexible and, and living in a way. It's not alive, but it still feels to us as it did when it was alive. And so that was a very powerful thing for people that even after you died, there was a part of your body that still held your essence and still held the significance of being alive that you could keep with you to remember someone. I think it's really interesting. Now, you and I both have come into this when we talk about hair work or we're showing hair work jewelry, that, that some people are absolutely fascinated by it, you know, just really interesting. And they kind of move forward to look at the, the details of, of the work. And then others literally step back. No. They are creeped out by it. They think it's, it's just the weirdest thing. Yet, I think it's interesting at the same time that most people have hair on their head mm -hmm. or, you know, on, the, on their body. I mean, I shaved this morning just for you, Kellen. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, yeah, so it's something that we live with daily. Yet some people are very creeped out by it when I suppose it has to do with somebody else's hair because it is so tangible of the body itself. I think that there are a number of reasons that hair work itself and also hair off the body became something that in a lot of contemporary culture we would consider gross or disgusting. Because I know a lot of people, I show them something and I'm like, oh, look at this beautiful thing. And they're like, oh, that's beautiful. And then you tell them it's made out of human hair and all of a sudden there's, you know, there's a revulsion that happens, yeah. but not everyone, like you said. Um, a couple of the things that changed, this was really hair, like I said, for hundreds of years in Europe was used as this kind of a mental mori. In the 19th century, it started to become a lot more prominent. Um, part of that reason for the prominence was that when Queen, Victoria, Queen Victoria's Albert died, she went into a very long period of mourning and everyone in the country had to mourn with her. So mourning right. became fashionable, it had to. And so hair became a part of that conversation and that presentation of yourself. In the United States, right around the same time, within 20 years, we were embroiled in the Civil War of the United States, mm -hmm. and thousands of people were dying. And it was um, at, at, in a small amount of time, and it was a, a confrontation with death um, at a grand scale, a concentrated scale that the country really hadn't dealt with before. And that's when the first practices for embalming started to happen and become more advanced so that people could, bodies could be preserved on the battlefield and then shipped back home to their families who would want to bury them. So once again, in this country um, that I'm in and you're in, um, mourning became for this, um, and this was definitely a white society practice that we're talking about here. It's a very European Anglo influence that's coming in. Um, one of the ways of mourning would be the wearing of black clothes and then incorporating the hair into jewelry of somebody that you had lost. But it wasn't only dead people. Um, people in the 19th century also kept locks of their lovers in lockets or braided and hidden in a ring um, as a way to be close to somebody when they were far away from you. So if you right. had a lover and you couldn't see them every day because you didn't have, oh, I don't know, Instagram Live, um, or you didn't have some other way of visually communicating with someone, all you had were letters, um, having a piece of their body that you had on yourself and whenever you wanted to think about them, maybe you had a tiny miniature that had been painted or you'd drawn a sketch, but to have a little bit of their hair gave you that really important personal connection that you couldn't have any other way at that time. Well, even, you know, mothers and fathers today, I mean, I mm -hmm. probably in your baby book, I know in my baby book, my mom, you know, clipped a little Snip. lock of what at the time I had very blonde hair. And, you know, and it's still there. And that's kind of that charming aspect. But maybe right. it's a little more innocent because it's children um, mm -hmm. versus, you know, an adult. Okay, I want to ask. So um, how did one learn to do this? And we, we do have to do this quickly. How did, because we have a lot of photos. How did one learn to do this? And also... Was it always professional? Was it, you know, happy hands at home? Uh, how was it done? So this was something that um, 
in, when it was first incorporated into jewelry was generally done by the jeweler. So you might send a lock of hair and the jeweler had professionals who would braid it and then insert it into the locket or insert it into the, the pin or the, or the ring. Um, later on, when it became really popular in the 19th century, suddenly there became this idea that, okay, if I'm going to send away a lock of hair in the mail to a stranger and they're going to create this very important um, object for me out of this hair of someone I love, how do I know they're sending my hair that I sent them back to me? It could mm. be somebody oh. else's hair. And sometimes it was. Um, and so there ah. began to be this fear of authenticity. And obviously needlework and other forms of textile work were very prominent within women's societies in the 19th century at home. It was a very much part of your, your fancy work or things that you could be accomplished at or even things that you needed to do to earn a living um, were practiced at home by women. And so working with hair then became something that a lot of women at home also learned to do. And manuals were written and women's magazines at the time would print articles for you on how to do this. And so when they started to print those manuals, they were with the um, declaration, this way you can guarantee that the hair that you're using is the hair that you think you're using and that you're memorializing and touching the person that you love. Um, so it was happening professionally and then it was happening at home later on. Um, and some of the more complicated pieces, definitely you can see where they're, they've been worked professionally, but then home people became very adept. And in addition to hair jewelry, there are hair wreaths. And um, can I see it there, right there? Um, oh, right. And those were very often made at home because you're making tiny little flowers out of hair um, with a process called gimp work. And you, you can collect hair from all of your friends and all of your family and then put them all together in one wreath, wreath. Sometimes they would be marked each flower with a tiny piece of paper with a number. And then you'd have a chart. And so if you looked at number 32, I go back, oh, that's Kevin's hair. That's that flower right there. And they became like little autograph books or little photo albums or little family trees by collecting the hair of all the people you loved. And every time you looked at the wreath, you know, your heart was full of happiness for that, I hope. Well, why don't we look at some, shall we? <laughs> and the thing is, uh, um, what we're going to show today are really different types of using hair. I mean, it's kind of astounding, the creativity and what people came up with to, to do this. Now, I have to admit, the first image is a little blurry, I'm sorry. But this is actually a late 18th century woman's ring. And you can see that it has what looks like a weeping willow, I'm assuming. Yes. And so Which, weeping willows, obvious, well, maybe not obviously, but in um, American and European culture, weeping willows were symbols. They looked like they were weeping, so they're crying, so let's associate them with mourning. Um, and so very often they're a motif that you see on rings, they're motifs you see in jewelry, they're motifs you see in embroideries and on tombstones. Um, this idea, of, and in cemeteries, you see actual weeping willows there. And so this is actually something where, um, you could achieve little images like this in two different ways. One would be palette work where you would take the hair and you would clean it very thoroughly. And then you'd um, cover it with a gum substance that would kind of glue it flat. You'd lay out the hair on a palette and then you could cut it into tiny little shapes and then glue those tiny little shapes to a surface to create um, a piece of art. Or you could take the hair and kind of grind it up into a powder and mix it with some watercolors, and then you could paint with it. So you'd paint Which, it with hair paint. That's what I think this is. I think this is painted, and it's probably on a little sliver, you know, of ivory would be my guess. A little and, sliver in the ring, and then the painting of the hair on top of it. And on top of it, right. Because a lot of hair has some kind of a brown tone to it. All of mm. these painted pieces tend to look like sepia pictures. Right, exactly. Now, um, this next piece amazes me. It's not a piece of jewelry. It's actually in a tiny little case. So it was more like a little curio cabinet piece. But um, no kidding, it's a, and it talk about a sepia scene. Here it is. It's amazing. It's amazing. And so you, I mean, if when, when people go to the FITM Museum website, and hopefully there'll be some larger images of these that people can look at, um, you, can, you can see in there how finely uh, how fine the brush must have been to have painted these tiny scenes with, with this pulverized hair. And actually, this one's not painted. This is embroidered. Oh, oh my this gosh. Oh, that's actually fantastic. embroidered hair. So let me get closer to it. We're going to get closer to it. Here it, I am, like, leaning into my phone here. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
It's re so really astounding. You, you, you have to look at this under, you know, a magnifier to really see because they're literally, you know, sewing with a single strand of hair. And Kevin, will you be able to make these images available later? We will. We are revamping okay. our entire website right now, and oh, we're hoping to time. launch our, our brand new shiny, sparkly website uh, at the end of this year. And we will be dumping yet more and more and more of our um, object images into the database, Past Perfect, that people can search, definitely. And honestly, I did not check to see online how many of our hair work pieces are in, uh, are available online, because we have 300 examples. Um, so it's a very rich resource to, to dive into. So, and okay. With, with the embroidery, as you're bringing up the next image, with the idea of embroidery, hair is a textile. Hair is right. a fiber. Um, you can use hair for embroidery. You can use hair for weaving. Um, it works the same as wool. You know, wool from sheeps, they're just hairs that we're using as a fiber. Um, it's just that hair from sheeps, the wool has a very different set of properties to it than a lot of human hair does. And so you can create different things with it. Um, but hair is a great thing to stitch with. It's so fine. And so- Yeah, long. exactly. I mean, it's just like any kind of- okay, um, what do you got next? Bombs. Yeah. Um, so I, this is one of my favorite pieces. It's so charming. It's a little brooch in the shape of a harp. And in the shape of a harp. And if you can see, is it the flat braided in there? In the, it is. Um, mm -hmm. All of this here going down the little curvature and then the, the, this area of the harp, all of that is inset braided hair. So this is the, the earlier tradition, and it did extend through the 19th century that, that we would have seen a lot of in Europe, where people would have braided hair into a flat textile and then inserted that textile into different shapes of pins or different shapes of rings and necklaces. Um, and the, the shape of the object could be significant to the wearer, or it could be significant to the person whose hair is being used. Um, Oh, I think we're we're losing you a little. <laughs> right. Singing in who were dead was very important. This is about this big, so it's extraordinary how um, detailed you know so much of this this work can be. We have a little lyre, so another kind of you know stringed instrument. We have a pair of binoculars. I mean, it's really really great and then we also have um um initials so you could kind of you know if you know you're wearing a c i'm wearing a k and we've and we've mm -hmm. given each other those those friendship you know initials with each other's hair i mean it's really fun very creative ways and and honestly if you didn't know exactly that this had hair into it you never would suspect it it's just it looks like almost like woven fabric so um Obviously, Absolutely. all sorts of kinds of hair were used, and this necklace is really beautiful Absolutely. and made, it looks like, from extremely long strands of blonde hair. So if, you, if we looked up really close at that necklace, you can see certain um, finding joining points, like halfway around the circumference of the necklace. And so that's where you can see where the hair lengths are joined together, where you have the gold findings. And the that you're focusing in on right now, um, you can see how the findings have been developed. It's in, sorry, developed specifically to accommodate hair designs. But yes, this is somebody who would have had some very long hair. And it could be that somebody would have cut off a lock of their hair so that they could have the entire length. Um, women did also save their hair when they brushed it um, in the 19th century because they would, they would brush it and they would take it off their brushes and put it in what's called a hair keep on their, on their dressing table. And then they would use that hair generally to stuff pillows um, and other types of things that needed stuffing and sometimes to stuff things that you put back in your hair. Um, but they wouldn't typically use that hair to do this kind of hair work because hair has a texture to it. Um, it has little scales on it. And if you put the hair in different directions where it's mm. the, the scales are going in different directions, it can cause issues when you're trying to create something really fine like this. Got it. So here we have blonde. 
Now, the guy, it's not just for women, you know, that we, we guys got into this too. And here is brunette hair. And this is a really elaborate man's watch fob. So this part is a little hook that would have probably clicked into either on his waistband or most likely onto into a pocket of a vest. Um, this would just hang down, you know, as, as fun decoration with, you know, a good luck horseshoe. And then the, the chain work with, with the um, little hook here would have hooked onto the top of his watch pocket. I'm oh, I think we're losing your feed. So Are you still hearing me over there, Kevin? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay. Is that you're using a woman's hair to make yep. this object that would be worn by a man. And generally, of course, it would have been your wife. And in the 19th century, it was also the time period when watches actually became um, de rigueur for men to wear. And it was because 19th century is almost when our modern um, European idea of time was, was solidified. And it's because of the train schedules. All of a right. sudden, Train lines are set up. You need to know that it's 12 o'clock in London and it's, it's 12 o'clock in Sheffield at the same time so that you know what time your train leaves London and arrives there. Um, so all of a sudden, everybody had to have it. Couldn't just look at the sky and say, it looks like it's close to 12. We need to know exactly right. when it was 12. So these precision objects that men all of a sudden became saddled with, like you had to be, your, your life was now measured out in this object that stayed with you all of the time. Um, which kind of leads to our, our culture today of, of packing in everything into these moments of time that we, we allot for ourselves. But you would have this watch constantly tethered to you, but it might be tethered to you by your wife's hair. And so right. you would and have your this, wife with this, you. Yeah, this, this, and around the horseshoe, that's all the hair work. And, and so it's incredibly detailed. I mean, the... The, the, the braiding structures that were done were... It, 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 phenomenal. I mean, just incredibly complex and must have used a great deal of hair because you think yes. of having to braid all of that and it would, as, as it was being, the hair was being braided, it would, you know, get shorter. So as I think it's interesting that, that you, uh, yeah. I think it's interesting you talk about time because men, at this time were the ones that were out in the world, generally. Mm -hmm. They were, it was business. It was, like you mentioned, timetables. Whereas women were more within the home, representing the home, children. Now, of course, we have sporting fashion coming out uh, this, later this year uh, and, and next year, uh, the exhibition, uh, which talks all about women being outdoors. So no, women were not just inside <laughs> all the time. But I think for developing such elaborate aspects of, di of displaying time for men, because I don't know this for women, I have never seen what was determined to be a woman's watch fob, um, specifically, uh, especially from the mid 19th century. So, okay, we got to keep moving on. Okay, as we're moving on, one more thing is that that yeah. actually shows time for women as well, because of the time that it takes to make the braids. And right. so when you see textile work that is a record of women's time and that's part of the research that I do too is using the objects that we have um, that are part of textile history that are the diaries of women because we don't have a lot of written records from women and right. the percentages that we do from men so the diaries that we have from women are these things that they made um, that they painted that they embroidered that they wove um, all of the fancy work and handwork that women did, that's where their time is measured. And so if it was a woman who braided this for her husband, which I don't think so, because that looks super fancy, like you sent it away somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, the record of time is there shown in the work of braiding and making also. So it's this beautiful synergy of time in, in multiple Absolutely. different ways. Absolutely. And that in no way was it less than anything of, of 
of, of what a man would go out and, and do this, this work. And what's interesting is their work is what survives, mm -hmm. which we get to see, enjoy, be, in awe of, be creeped out by um, today, you know, more than 150 years later. It's amazing. Now, one of my favorite pieces also, I say that a lot in our collection, because I have all <laughs> pieces. You can have but, all the favorites. You know, <laughs> so we looked at blonde hair. We looked at brunette hair. My favorite, again, is a blonde and brunette plaid bow. So charming. So amazingly charming. So this type of work here and what we've seen with some of the other work, this would have been done on what's called table work, where you have a round table-like structure with a hole in the middle, and you would insert a kind of a rod in there, and strands of hair would have been off the edge of the table, hung um, and weighted with some kind of a bobbin, like very much like lace making. And so you would weave the hair around a tube that was inserted, inserted in the center of the table to create these hollow tubes of hair that then you could turn into little bows or you could cut the tube and shape it around a wooden form and then you could boil it so that it would hold that shape and you could bake it so the hair would be as though you were setting it with a heat with a curling iron that you could set it in that shape so that's how you get that round shape of the teardrop at the bottom. Um, but here you have to also then consider in your weaving pattern to make sure that you're following a tartan pattern and you have to have a friend who has blonde hair if you're a brunette or, or um, the other way around. But I think this is magnificent to think about the, the textile connections here of hair to be able to create tartan with your hair work as well. I mean, who thought of this? Come on. I, I'm not clever enough to have thought of doing, you know, blonde to brunette plaid yeah. hair, right? <laughs> And what I love about um, these tube pieces as well is that they are so incredibly lightweight. They're, they're made they of are. nothing. Made of nothing. They are. It's they are. Air. And the thing is, they're really spongy too. You know, it's, it's like they're like little, little bouncy sponges. It's, it's really they're amazing to, to feel. They are, exactly. Um, okay, so we, we, uh, I wanted to show again because this is, this is something you alluded to earlier um, when we were talking about just how to make hair. Um, here is mm. brunette red and blonde hair in this fabulous brooch that has been kind of cut and quaffed. <laughs> and so they've been shaped into these Prince of Wales feathers. And, and the way that they would do this is they would take the hair lock and they would clean it very thoroughly. And then they would take a tiny, tiny, tiny curling iron and curl the end of that hair lock. And then they would take that lock of hair that had been curled and they would put a gum on it and they would kind of glue it down to a pallet and then they'd put something heavy on top to flatten it and let it sit. And then after it had dried, they'd check on it and see if it all looked appropriate and if they needed to wet it a little bit to move it around a little bit, they could, but then they could put more gum on top and then, you know, let it dry again. And that's how they would create these Prince of Wales feathers and then some other types of, of work where you see the hair, but the curls are kind of flat and look as though they've been stuck down to the surface. But I just love the fact that they would have like mini curling irons to create those tiny curls. This is a tiny piece have here. Seen, have you ever seen one of those curling irons? No, I haven't. I'm assuming I, I mean, any have any piece of metal, you know, but I don't know. Yeah, right. right. And all of the little foliage and these flowers, they're also hair work. It's all, you know, been glued and laid down and then cut out and then applied to whatever. I don't know exactly what this background is, but it's really fantastic. It's really amazing so, so you have to go through all those steps to put this whole jewelry piece together. And the thing is, you know, most likely, and correct me if I'm wrong, Caroline, that this was probably either all friends or family members, mm -hmm. right? Likely. Okay, so this, isn't, this is not mourning necessarily. No. I mean, it could have been, sure, but not everything that has to do with hair work is mourning. It, like you said, it could be friendship. Also, we have a really great piece that is definitely kind of family related. And this, this it's about this big. It is really tiny, but um, it is this brooch, or excuse me, it's a pendant with all sorts of different hair that's been plaited. That's fantastic. And so you could have an object like this with all of your family in it or all of your friends in it. Um, and each one you could, you could then remember by looking at this hair. And that would be really simple to make at home, to do those flat braids and then insert them in there. You know, so were these types of pendants available for sale that, that a woman or, you know, a child or a man 
would know like, okay, I'm going to collect my family's hair and then have that set in. So could you buy these kind of elements yourself? Oh, yeah. You could buy finding kits, just like you can today. You could buy your own home crafting kit and put together certain bracelets or necklaces or objects. And, you know, they would give you all of the parts and all you needed to do was supply the hair and mm -hmm. then braid it and insert it in there. Or you could send it away to a jeweler and how you could do your braiding at home and you could take it to your local jeweler and have them insert it. Or you could send just the raw hair to the jeweler and have them braid it and then insert it into the piece. It's kind of like wearing the hair wreath that you have on display. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Keeping that okay, close so, to you. So what's neat also about this is on the back, and this is minute, these little, these little, these little roundels are no more than like three eighths of an inch. I mean, they are absolutely, they're just tiny. Every person's name of who had the hair is on the back and it's dated 1845. That's fantastic. And what a wonderful record so that we actually know whose hair it is. So often we see these hair pieces and we have absolutely no idea who the hair belongs to. And even so having Robert there, so we've both, I think. Yeah, and having even this in the engraving done on such minute with beautiful scripting and so forth. I mean, there was so much care and thought and uh, that, were, that were put into these pieces because, you know, as you mentioned, death, death was very much a part of life. Uh, you know, the, the uh, women dying in childbirth, children dying of all, you know, if, if, if your child got past age five, you were really a fortunate person. Um, so, you know, these, these were the ways to remember all of these people. And, and we don't know if they were all alive. I mean, I have not searched out each one of these people. It make a fascinating research paper, definitely. Absolutely. I mean, I know you, my sister has three children and she wears necklaces with gemstones from each one of her children or initials from each one of her children. This would be the exact same thing in the Victorian time, wearing a pendant that has locks of hair from each one of your children. I, I saw a bracelet once that had a beautiful cameo painted on it. And the, the strap of the bracelet was, was braided of two different types of hair. And the note that went with it was that it was a Mother's Day gift that the father had made, oh. where he'd taken his, daughter's, his two daughters' hair and had them braided so that then the mother was given this gift of this cameo with then her two daughters' hair forming the bracelet strap. It's beautiful. I have something I have to show you, but it's in a book, and I left the book right over there, so I got to jump over and get it instead of putting okay. it next to my seat. I'll be right back. No worries. And then we get to you look at your beautiful tree that you have. I have to figure out if it's a living tree or if you've somehow. I'm back. <laughs> You're back. Fantastic. So this is going to show up backwards, but this is the fabulous catalog that Christina and I did in 2011. And there are a couple of hair work pieces that I wanna show off that came from um, uh, Andrea Tice uh, via her mother. And they're unlike anything that I've ever seen before. I've never seen other examples. And I wonder if you have, this is one of my favorites. You've heard that before. <laughs> this uh, is a miser's bag made of, I guess, netted human hair. Netted human hair. It's very strong, like I said. I mean, it would make a perfect material to make something like this out of. Um, so for people who aren't familiar with what a miser's bag is, it's a, a kind of a long pouch that has an opening in the center and a ring around the middle and or two rings. And so what you do with the miser's pouch is that you, you slide the rings to make the opening accessible. And then you can put your coins in there. And then you slide the ring down so it kind of scrunches up um, the area of the bag right above where the coins are and then that holds them in place and so it's kind of these two lobes that you're carrying and they were often made of net so they're very collapsible um, and then they can expand to accommodate whatever it is that you put in them. You can see the scale here which is great with the hand and then I also yeah. love how you have it made out of a different material there. I'm glad you like that because, you know, I, I, I just, it's the first thing I thought about when Andrea donated. In fact, I borrowed the bag first for an exhibition that I did on Morning um, a number of years ago. And I thought of those mitts, you know, they're so common with all that, you know, and it's in white or cotton or black cotton or something. And um, I thought, wow, that's just, so it just echoes that. And I wonder if the woman who actually um, had that miser's bag 
you know, also wore those netted mitts. Netted mitts. I, okay, I'm scanning real fast to, yes, bring up. Now, Kara, have you ever seen another miser's bag? I don't recall. You know, I, I feel like I haven't been looking specifically at them, so I'm trying to recall if I've looked at yours or if I've looked at them elsewhere. So. Yeah, you did look at ours we'll when you were out, definitely. Memory. And I've just, I've never seen another one. And, yes. and it's not that ours is necessarily unique. Maybe it okay. is. But it'd be interesting to see another one to, you know, to compare them. But I've, I've never been able to do that. Um, and, and this other, this is unique too. I don't know of another one. This is a uh, hair work diadem. And this is one of my favorites. The, when I first started talking to Kevin about hair work, he said, well, we have a, a diadem that's made out of hair. And I said, oh my goodness, you must send this image to me immediately. So it, it may be difficult to see at the scale if you're looking on your phone, but this, there's a wire frame and then there's a netting of hair that is stretched across the wire frame to create the body of this diadem. And then the gold work is applied on top of it. So it's, it's like two, it's like a bag or a, um, two layers of hair work and then the wire frame in the middle um, to create this amazing sculptural three-dimensional object of netted hair that is hollow in the middle and you can see through. Um, and whenever I look at this, I wonder, did the woman who wore it have blonde hair so that it stood out? Or did I thought the same thing. Similar color um, so that it almost looks as though your hair is growing into this diadem of its own making. It's a very Medusa thing going on here. I love it. Or that the gold work uh, set with the um, turquoise pearl and pearls is almost floating around your head, you know, as opposed to kind of being planted in it. Uh, yeah, I've, I've wondered that too, because if it were, if she were a brunette, it definitely would have blended away. Absolutely. And so Kevin, I'm kind of glancing at the comments and somebody wants to know what the name of this book is. Oh, <laughs> it's called Fabulous backwards right now, but it's fabulous. And um, this was published in 2011 by the FITA Museum. And you can uh, purchase it through our museum website, which, but you can't do it right now, unfortunately, because our museum shop is closed, uh, because our galleries are closed due, due to all the situations that are going on. Um, but it, it, believe me, it's, it's worth acquiring because it's pretty fabulous. <laughs> okay, we got to keep moving on. Okay. Um, and so it just FYI, that is Italian. The, the diadem is Italian and it, it, it still has its original box that, that was custom made for it. So we have the maker's mark and everything. So it's, it's, it's uh, marvelous that we have that much information. Okay. So I think what's interesting also is we're talking about hair work, but it's not always human hair. No. And here we have a little suite of jewelry, a, a parure of a bracelet, brooch, and earrings. And I love that the earrings because they're fuchsias. And so this is amazing. And so very likely this is made out of horse hair. Um, yep. And because hair work became so popular, you might not always have access to human hair, but after a while the hair work became so popular, it was the look of the object that was really important, perhaps more so than it was made out of hair of a loved one or hair from your family. And so people used other materials that would have the same properties as hair. Um, and obviously horse hair does, it's stiffer though, and you can feel it. Um, and so you can use horse hair though in the same way to weave objects that you would adorn your body with. And horse hair is still used in many cultures around the world to, to weave into objects that you might use in your home or that you might use for your body as well. But to see it used this way is really, um, is really delightful because actually the, the patterning of what they're doing is slightly different from what we see with the majority of human hair work. And, and I, I'm assuming the horse hair, may, was it boiled? How, how did they get the, 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 the kind of whitish mushroom kind of color out of this? Because it doesn't seem like it's a natural horse hair color. Really? I mean, I, I honestly don't know a lot about horses, but perhaps it's a, a, from a Palomino. I don't know. That's just a guess okay. off the top of my head. Um, but that's a great question. If we have any horse people out there, let us yeah. know. Could you, could you get a horse's mane or tail in this color? Um, or would you have to bleach the hair in some way? Right. To that's what color? I always wondered. 
Mm -hmm. With humans, um, white hair was very prized. If you could get enough white hair to make a piece of jewelry out of, that would be really wonderful. Um, and so you'd have to ask your grandmother, you know, if she'd let you cut some of her hair if you wanted something to remember her. Or after she died, you could ask to have a piece of her hair that you could then transform into something. Mm -hmm. Well, and moving on to another friend. Um, this is specifically for Christina who is the associate curator of the FIDA Museum. We don't know if her, her name is Fifi or his name is Fido, but we have this adorable brooch with the family pooch. People so, love dogs even in the Victorian years. Exactly. And what's really great is that you flip the brooch over and oh, that's there's fantastic. the dog mirror. That's fantastic. Oh. Um, and, and this is great because it also shows that one of the simplest ways of keeping somebody's hair was just to tie it with a ribbon and keep that lock of hair in a glass container. And here it's the, the glass or the crystal that's forming the back of the brooch. So that when you wore it, other people would see this beautiful image of your puppy and you would have their hair on the inside of that brooch against your, your, the fabric of your garment. And you could turn it over whenever you wanted to and, and remember Fido or Fifi or whomever it is that you have in your portrait there. <laughs> Maybe it's Caroline or Kevin. <laughs> could be. Fluffy. Fluffy, exactly. Okay, so this also is a fascinating piece to me. We have everything from, you, you've seen, you know, earrings and brooches and pendants and bracelets. And I mean, it, it, the collection is incredibly rich. We also have a, a lot of rings. Um, this is a fascinating ring because honestly, if I didn't know it was, a, it was from a hair work collection and I'm looking at it like, oh, wow, this is a really beautiful gold ring. It's kind of in the shape of, a, of like a, a belt with a buckle around your, your finger, I wouldn't necessarily understand that there was hair work until it sprung open and all the hair work is underneath. I love these rings. So this, when you have two layers to the ring here, you have the inner gold shell with an indentation in it and the hair has been flat braided and then inserted in there. And then there's kind of a, an outer, as you said, sprung layer that is then adorned with what could look like a belt or a garter um, that's that then mm. when it closes around it entirely encases the hair so I could wear that ring and you would never know that someone that I loved their hair this memento this love token was hidden in there so it was something that was just for me um, and I could look at it whenever I wanted to but I could keep the ring on all the time and so I would have that constant connection to someone without having to make it public that I was sharing this when it's, when it's closed, I mean, it is very, it's definitely sprung. I mean, they're, they're, it's got tension. And when it's closed, unless you would know to flip open this little tab underneath, um, you would never know that it was, it so I wonder how many, you know, rings out there or other forms of jewelry have these hidden compartments of hair that have yet to be discovered. Absolutely fascinating. And, and really highlighting that idea um, about the personal nature of some of these objects, that they aren't necessarily, it's, a, it's kind of a private morning or a continuous morning that you would want to carry on privately, or even someone who's alive, who you want to remember, um, but you're keeping it to yourself. You're keeping it very close to you. Whereas later mm -hmm. in the 19th century, we start to get these objects, as we've seen some of them already, where the structure of the object is made from the hair. So the hair comes out from the hidden compartment, it comes out from underneath the crystal, and it becomes the object. And so for me, this is the really fascinating time in hair work, because the hair, when it becomes the object, it becomes its own body. And so you have somebody's body part, which is then through somebody's touch transformed into this new object, this new body, given to somebody else. And as they wear it, um, their hair on their body mingles with this hair. Their skin touches this skin. So you're actually touching this body part with your body and continuously having that connection of touch. And so even with a pin that you might pin on the outside of your garment, if the pin is made out of hair, you're going to touch that hair every time you pick it up to put it on. And if you're wearing a necklace or you're wearing a bracelet or earrings, you're constantly in touch with that other person's body all of the time. And it's just such a fascinating 
method of connection and that perhaps in COVID times, we need to be sending each other our hair so that we can, I can wear right. locks of hair of the people I love that I cannot touch right now. And you can also defend yourself with hair too. No kidding. <laughs> We've got, a, we've, I've got to keep us going because we still have quite a few to get through and we only have 15 minutes. Oh, How about awesome. these hat pins from about 1900? Which are wonderful. Um, Kevin was telling me about these that if you, they're hard to see, but up close it's cellophane and then hair wrapped together to create this, this shiny bead at the end. And so you're taking hair and then reapplying it to the head which also is what was happening with the diadem here. And then the, the cellophane was a new material. And I find it right. really exciting that this is a really old material and a really like new material that's exciting and innovative and technologically advanced that are being combined together into this object. And you could defend yourself. And you could defend yourself, absolutely. <laughs> okay, this is actually the last, um, um, I think the last in, in, uh, hair work piece that we have in the collection kind of time wise, it's into the 20th century. And I love that it is, it's different shades of brown hair. So it's not just one hair, but it is Haley's Comet. I love that. This I love a, that the it's hair a little, work a little uh, was broke. used to memorialize this event. Yeah. And it'd be interesting. So I have not. I have not looked up to see like, okay, how many times did Haley's Comet kind of show up in the early part of the 20th century that might help to date this one? Because there's a tiny little bar brooch in the back here and then the little tails of Haley's Comet and they're very springy. So as you would walk, it's kind of like, you know, bouncing along with you. <laughs> and so this technique here is the gimp work that you would use to create um, hair flowers that you would then create your hair wreaths out of. So those tiny little loops that you see are created by twisting um, a, a, a little bit of hair, maybe eight strands of hair with a wire. And so you, you wrap the wire with the hair and twist and move it a little bit and twist. And then you create these, this tiny set of loops and then you can twist the set of loops to have them offset like that. This is a, a relatively simple technique. Um, not, I mean, once you, once you start doing it, um, right. And then you can create these wonderful, fantastic shapes and the wire holds the shape of the object for you. Well, I've, I'm inserting something we did not talk about because I forgot about this and, it, and you actually did mention it oh. at the very beginning of your, of talking about the different ways that hair was used. This is a pendant that is so charming. I can't stand it. <laughs> oh my goodness. So that this is... little guy, unfortunately we don't know who it is. The pendant literally mm -hmm. is this big. I mean, it's, it's huge. I mean, it would have kind of really weighed somebody down. It's very large. So this, you know, this, this, this little kid with his, with his little um, jumping jack or little, you know, Camellia dell'arte kind of figure. <laughs> and then on the back, Mama was real proud because she had all of his curls. Oh, inserted. Kevin, it could be you with your blonde curls. No, seriously, I kind of look like this as a kid. <laughs> I had a lot of curly hair, blonde hair. And, um, but yeah, I just thought this was so great because this is actually one of the kind of the last times that these painted on ivory figures were being done. I mean, this was very much the, uh, the late 18th century, early 19th century, uh, uh, popular jewelry kind of technique. And, um, and I, I think that possibly his, his portrait was taken from a photograph mm. of the little kid versus the little kid sitting there posing. For and, the artist, and do you know is this was this a ch this was made for a child who was alive or not? You know, no idea. The thing is, there's no indication at all. There's no black enamel work. There's nothing that indic indicates that this this child you know passed away early. Um, but instead, it it might just be mom. You know, it's That's time great. to cut. He's because he's getting older, so it might have been at the time that he was breached. So, so going from wearing little skirted outfits to wearing little, you know, little short pant outfits mm -hmm. as as he was growing up, and it might have been at the time that they cut off his curls. You know, that to give him a be. shorter haircut. That okay, we're moving on. We're moving on. Um, so, this is fascinating to me mm -hmm. because this is Johann Hummel who was a very favorite, famous court composer in Vienna, or late 18th century, early 19th century. Uh, he was the star pupil of Mozart, lived with the family for a couple of years. 
His music, I hear it all the time on KUSC here in LA. Um, it's really great, he, trumpet and piano, forte. Um, he was the principal uh, conductor for the Congress of Vienna in 1914, excuse me, 1814, when you know, Mo, uh, uh, Napoleon was defeated. They, all these crowned heads were coming together to redo the lines of Europe and they needed to be entertained. So he was entertaining them. And we actually have his court suit. It is extraordinary. It's the only garment of his that's known to survive. We also have a folio of his music, which is, as far as I know, is the only Johann Hummel music in the United States. And what's interesting is this beautiful lithograph from the 1820s with a lock of his hair, which I can only surmise that Mrs. Hummel possibly stitched onto her husband's lithograph. And, Have you and here seen... was an important reminder. Um, I, I haven't seen another image like this with the lock of hair attached to the image, but, but very famously when, when famous people would die, they would have, you know, Nelson, Lord Nelson famously had a lock of his hair cut off. And then you, sometimes you see it all go to one person and sometimes you see it distributed amongst a bunch of people who either were collectors or who loved the person. And so maybe this was done, as you said, by a person who loved them as a way of remembering them. Um, and right. then later, this is part of the, for me, the sad story about all of this hair jewelry and, and the beautiful part of it also is you don't have to be a famous person to be memorialized with hair jewelry. Right. Just somebody had to love you. And if somebody loved you, maybe they saved some of your hair and put it in a piece of jewelry and we see it today. And we may not know who that person is, which is then the sad part for me, but we know that you were loved and we know that somebody cherished you and that somebody wanted to be close to you. And so these pieces are beautiful to me because they talk about that connection between right. two people and how important um, people and bodies and touch and, and being connected to each other really is. Um, I've also been collecting <laughs> I love those. Oh my gosh. So this is actually a gift from Ran, uh, uh, from Fran Kleibert a few years ago. And it dates to the early part of the 19th century, you know, 1810, 1820. Um, and it's that kind of frisure, the, the, mm -hmm. you know, would have been worn at the front of the head, you know, covering, um, covering her real hair. Maybe this woman had straight hair and Curly hair was popular, and so here she's wearing a little frizz that um, uh, would have been tied then around the back of her head and covered over by her other hair and then worn with a bonnet. Or as so often happens, when a new hairstyle comes in that requires you to cut part of your hair and you don't want to cut part of your hair, ah. you can buy these little things and you're like, look, I've got bangs, you know, and they wouldn't have called them bangs then. But you could have all of a sudden the most fashionable hairstyle without having to cut your hair. And if you didn't want to have that hairstyle every day, you just take it off and, and leave it until your next ball that you have to attend where you're really going right. to dress up. Um, one of my favorite pieces, and I did donate this myself. I, uh, <laughs> it's one of my favorite pieces. It, and it's the only original Apollo's uh, coiffure that I've ever seen. Uh, this is, a, and, and I'm sorry, I, I have seen this exact in a fashion plate about hairstyles, and I don't have that to show today, but it is blonde hair that has been put into this shell shape. It literally is a shell, and it, and it has a convex um, shape to it as well. And the woman's braid, she would have braided her hair, would have wrapped around here and then been secured with pins and then maybe flowers and feathers and stuff stuck in, and so it's lacquered, so it, it keeps its shape perfectly, and then it's secured also with, with metal pins, like almost like bobby pins inside to help keep uh, its shape. It really is extraordinary. It's amazing, and it's also a reminder that sometimes when we look at these really fantastical hairstyles, especially from the 1830s, where they have the, the Apollo knots and the, and the what looks like the lacquered pieces that are there, they aren't necessarily spending 10 hours in a chair to get that done. You might just insert right. a hair piece like this um, to be able to give of this to the And so what's, what's fun also, and I- Even and I, people with long hair, I have quite long hair.
You're, bre you're breaking up on me. Well, I, I also wanted to show that not only, so this is the, the actual one that would have been worn by a woman, you know, standing up in the back, but also we have this really extraordinary 1830s doll that was donated to us uh, by the estate of um, Anna Lee Shelter. And she is wearing her little leather boots. She has her original dress on. It, she's absolutely beautiful. But what's extraordinarily rare and amazing is that the doll still has its human hair wig. It's the only surviving example that I've ever seen. Oh, I think just lost Carolyn. Uh, the only example I've ever seen of the um, a, a surviving period hairstyle. We see them in fashion plates. We see them in paintings. But to actually be able to see and to kind of to look all the way around uh, is really amazing. I'm so sorry we lost Carolyn, and we're almost out of time. So I'm just going to show one more piece that, that she and I spoke about. And it is the last piece date-wise in the Fitta Museum collection. And this is the fairest um, coiffure roll. So this is from the 18, excuse me, the 1940s um, that you would have wound around your head and then you would have put your, your actual hair and it's to create some of those really wonderful, elaborate uh, hairstyles that were popular in the early 1940s uh, that then you would perch your little bebe hat on. Um, so it's uh, amazing really how much hair has affected our lives, both, um, you know, personally, as we comb our hair, we get our hair cut um, ever so often. We wash our hair, hopefully, at least every other day. <laughs> and, um, you know, that it's then also been taken for centuries to be very important um, personally, because it is the most personal thing about us that we can then give over to somebody else. And that sometimes it's very visual, that it is something meant to show off. Sometimes it's hidden um, and it's, it's very secretive um, that only that wearer maybe knows about um, the, the, the hair in those concealed compartments. But then also aspects of presentation, such as seeing the painted pendants or the little photograph of Fido, um, you know, that then have the, the locks of hair or the you know, the little tufts of the dog's hair that's been put, you know, it, it's, it just makes an aspect of charm. And, you know, like I said earlier, I'm really happy that my mom, you know, clipped off a little lock of my hair when I was a little baby. And it's in my baby book because I see it ever so often. And it just reminds me of that love, as Carolyn was talking about, that real love of, um, of you know, a way that we can express that and save it because it is an aspect of the human body that can survive millennia. And uh, so I just wanna thank everybody uh, for joining us today uh, on the Fitta Museum collection conversation. Uh, hope to see you again in two weeks. Everybody uh, out in the world, uh, please be safe, stay healthy, and please wear your mask. So thank you so much for being with us today. Bye-bye.